I'm Gary Johnson. I'm the Libertarian presidential nominee for president in 2016, and you are watching Facets TV. Amazing. Good for you. Welcome up, Kevin McDonald, and you're watching Facets Television. And tonight we have a really special guest, the former governor of New Mexico and current presidential candidate for the Libertarian Party, Gary Johnson. Tonight we're going to talk a lot about Gary Johnson's ideas about the future of the world and the United States with him as president. Thank Kevin, you thank so you. For coming thank in. you. Yeah, appreciate you your bet. coming so far. So, for starters, has the world ever been a better place? I mean, don't we get along better than ever? Aren't kids smarter than ever? And when the number one law enforcement tool is the smartphone we have in our pockets, mm -hmm. um, you know what? Things haven't been better. We got issues, police shootings, blacks being shot, mm -hmm. um, and it's a real issue. But, you know, we communicate these things now uh, faster and better than ever and I'm optimistic that we actually uh, come to grips with this in, in a really quick way. Is that not part of the problem though? Um, the, the communication is so readily available that we're just seeing what really has always been there. That's exactly right but for the first time rather than having our heads in the sand over this uh, the recognition that it has been going on forever mm -hmm. and let's stop it. Yeah so the fundamental disarray at the DNC I think is going to be a pretty significant advantage for you along with I believe the Republican choice. Um, how can you take advantage of uh, the idea that Bernie has left behind I think a lot of disenfranchised people who may identify with your libertarian views? Well I, I think that is the case and I think broadly speaking we do have the two most polarizing political figures of all time and space that are you know Democrats and Republicans and there's this big six lane highway down the middle that I think right now the Libertarian Party occupies. Keep government out of my bedroom, keep them uh, out of my pocketbook, and uh, skeptics when it comes to our military interventions that have resulted in the world being less safe, not more safe, and let's go all the way back to Vietnam to, mm -hmm. to use that as an example. So with the idea that Bernie's people, many of them were pushing towards what I would classify as socialism, I mean he's openly a democratic socialist, whatever that means. Um, but libertarians don't come with free stuff in hand. So how do you pull some of those people over? Kevin, I'm wondering if, uh, if Bernie Sanders supporters really don't recognize the fact that they do recognize that you cannot bring about income equality. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter taking from Paul, uh, that's an equation that Peter loves but that government can and should create equal opportunity, mm -hmm. something that is achievable. An equal opportunity is completely contrary to crony capitalism, which is alive and well in this country. Mm -hmm. And crony capitalism, simply defined, is when government interjects itself into any sort of transaction, there's a bias toward those, in this case, that can pay for that bias, pay for that influence. It's for sale, it's being sold. Equal opportunity, look, get government out of these equations. Mm -hmm. Genuine free market is the opposite of crony capitalism. So how do you fight the, the, the free request from everybody from the Defense Department to uh, those that work in government to commercial corporations that are looking for handouts here in Anaheim, for example, we have a huge hotel being built and they want tax uh, write-offs for their hotel when they're making one of the most profitable companies in the country. So it isn't just those people wanting free college and free health care and free, 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 free. It's the corporations and the military as well. Well, uh, you're, you're pointing out exactly what, uh, what, is, what takes place. Almost all of my money is in real estate. And real estate, I mean, when you look at the, when you, when you look at the system, mm -hmm. and it's been gamed this way, and we look, we all, the way that it is, we try and take advantage of it. Well, real estate, um, 
I buy an asset, real estate asset, that historically increases in value, and yet I get to depreciate it over its lifetime. Mm -hmm. So I actually am making money while I get to report that I'm losing money. And then at the very end of it all, I don't pay income tax on my gain. Mm -hmm. I pay capital gains or I don't pay any tax at all because I can now uh, trade the property uh, in a transaction that goes completely untaxed. Mm -hmm. Well, that's just an example of what exists in every single area. The tax code gets gamed for those that have money. I really think that abolishing income tax and corporate tax uh, would absolutely do away with 80% of Washington lobbyists that are there simply to game the corporate tax mm -hmm. system to the advantage of their paying uh, um, employers. So let's assume with what's going on in the, in the current political environment that you actually have, for the first time in my lifetime, a chance to win. And you do win. Now we've got, a instead of a bifurcated potential, we potentially have a Democratic Senate, a Republican House, and a Libertarian President. How do you govern under that circumstance? Imagine if Donald Trump is elected. Just how polarized the world will be because Democrats are never going to go along with anything that Donald Trump has to say. Mm -hmm. Imagine if Hillary is elected. Republicans are never going to go along with anything that Hillary has to say. It's going to be more polarized than ever. How about a couple of guys, presidential, vice presidential candidate, former two-term governors, Republican governors in heavily blue states that were fiscally conservative, socially liberal, got reelected by bigger margins the second time than the first time. How about a couple of those animals that say to both sides, challenge both sides to come together? Mm -hmm. Look, come on, the world has had enough of this polarization. Let's come together on some very specific issues and move the world forward. Under which scenario do you potentially have that chance. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's the, the last one that I mentioned, the two former Republican governors, the libertarians that are in office, mm -hmm. that are going to appoint Republicans and Democrats both to their administration. Of course, all those Republicans and Democrats will have a libertarian bent, but mm -hmm. that's going to be the makeup. It won't be polarized. So with that said, um, how do you get the word out? Because name recognition, of course, is a challenge for any third party candidate. What is it that you can do now with all of this noise and the rancor going on between the two parties? Well, Kevin, whether or not we, we well, there is no chance of winning without being in the presidential debates. And to be in the presidential debates, you have to be at 15% in the polls. Right now, what we have to have happen is the polls need to start coming out. Johnson. Trump and Clinton, who would you vote for? Right now, it's always Trump and Clinton, and then in many of the polls now, as a third option down the list, what happens when you add Johnson to the equation? Well, that's a 12%, 10% phenomenon uh, currently. Mm -hmm. um, but the news media, 99% of the news media reports that uh, it's just Trump and Clinton. So let me ask, um, you've been coined an isolationist um, by some people, and uh, in fact, one of the things that I read about was that you had made a statement to the effect that you expect China to take care of North Korea and that we would withdraw troops from South Korea. In the face of their aggression in the South China Sea and some of the other behaviors basically disregarding the UN's ruling that they don't have rights to the property they're claiming and so on, um, do we really want China running or supporting one of our allies um, to the degree that they may actually have uh, control of that territory? Well, I reject the notion that libertarians are isolationists. Donald Trump is isolationist. Mm -hmm. um, libertarians are non-interventionists. The fact that we intervene in other countries' affairs, mm -hmm. that we try and get in the middle of other countries' affairs, uh, I think have had the unintended consequence of making things worse, not better. I think the biggest threat in the world right now is North Korea. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and that those nuclear weapons at some point are going to be able to be delivered by ICBMs that are going to work. Absolutely. So, libertarians, let's rule the world with free market and let's rule the world with diplomacy. So how about from a diplomatic standpoint, we join with China mm -hmm. to address the situation of North Korea and just how dangerous this is. They recognize it. They've got it. We have 40,000 troops in South Korea. There is zero chance that North Korea is going to invade South Korea conventionally. Zero chance. Are they going to do something from a nuclear standpoint? Perhaps, but we've got them covered with our nuclear umbrella and then you stand back and go, do we really want to be going to nuclear war because of North Korea? This is the biggest danger that exists. Do we really want to be going to war with China? Oh, and by the way, I'm going to, I hope to get elected President of the United States. I'm going to honor all treaties and obligations. But China uh, and the fact that it's talking about disputed areas that are uninhabited, you can call them rocks uh, out in the South Pacific. Do we really want to go to war over that? I don't think so. So I do see an opportunity here to join with China and diffuse what I'm going to say is the most dangerous situation on earth today. So one of the things that Trump has said that has been declared reckless, um, which I tend to agree with, is the fact that he would only honor the NATO treaty for those that are paying. However, I, I have some concerns about Turkey, for example, a member of NATO. Do we really, at this point, see ourselves supporting what could very well turn into an Islamist state? Well, uh, uh, Nate, your example is terrific, but let me just uh, point out Turkey and the fact that it is a member of NATO, and we have armed Turkey to the teeth. Mm -hmm. And if they do turn into an Islamic state, uh, where are they going to get their armaments? Well, they already have them, and, it's, and they're all from the United States. And you can argue that that also includes a bit of nuclear arsenal, because we have that uh, that exists uh, in Turkey also. So, uh, you know, this, this is our military interventions. And we need to honor our obligations, period, that no one fears that... Uh, as President Johnson, no one can fear that we're not going to honor those obligations. But to examine those obligations and going forward, that we might make the world a safer place? Uh, really, do we want to go to war over U the Ukraine when they were a former member of the Soviet Union? I don't think so. So at what point do you um, start to wonder if there is not aspirations of a growth of the Soviet Union if they start to move towards more Baltic states, for example? Well, we don't, we don't have to be allied with Russia, but we don't have to antagonize them either. And keep in mind, uh, they were the ones that broke up the Soviet Union. It was Russia mm -hmm. uh, bec becoming a democracy. Couldn't afford it. Our, uh, couldn't afford it. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and that they can't afford that expansion today. Lessons learned. Um, but we do, we do not need to put it, we, do, we don't need to put it in the faces of uh, Russia or China. And now I'm back to China. Imagine if Chinese, imagine if there were 40,000 Chinese troops in, uh, in Central America. How would we feel about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. It is, there, it is a different zone of the world. So let's pull it back to domestic, if we can. You've been quoted as saying something, to, if I may paraphrase you, to the effect of if a truck is passing from the United States to Mexico and a truck is coming from Mexico to the United States and they pass each other on the road, they should do it at 60 miles an hour unfettered. You're an open border guy. Um, at what, what are your limitations on immigration across our borders? Well, um, I think that we should make it as easy. I'm not looking to change any border policy uh, currently, but currently we have illegal crossings at really an all-time low. So this is really an overblown uh, immigration, illegal immigrate, immigrants, undocumented workers coming across the border. But we should make it as easy as possible for anybody that wants to come into this country and work to be able to get a work visa. 
and a work visa should entail a background check and a social security card so that applicable taxes get paid. Uh, a couple days ago in the Wall Street Journal, the Wharton School of Business, uh, that's where Donald Trump got his degree, came out with an analysis of lessening immigration, uh, allowing an increase in immigration for only high-skilled workers, and allowing for a 50% increase in immigration, uh, the effect that that would have our, on our economy. Well, restricting immigration would have a negative economic impact. High-skilled workers would have a small positive impact. Increasing immigration by 50% would actually have a very beneficial, huge economic impact. So that is, uh, let me just uh, dig into that a little bit if I can, because we've clearly seen wage depression from a lot of cheap labor in the United States. And I think that was the goal of allowing the number of illegal aliens to come into the country over the last three decades. But they're here, they need to be dealt with one way or the other. Let's move to the criminal alien issue in sanctuary cities. Uh, there are laws, regardless of whether people agree with them or not. How do you feel about the federal, about cities disregarding federal well, federal law? Well, I, I do believe that, uh, first of all, I don't see it as a disregard to federal law. I, I do see it in the, under the purview of localities allowing this. And mm -hmm. Santa Fe is a sanctuary city, and I live in Santa Fe. That's mm -hmm. where one of my homes is. It's not a negative. Uh, it, it's a positive. Okay. Well, we'll have to agree to disagree on that one. All right. Um, on the Second Amendment, uh, libertarians in general are pretty strong about their support for the Second Amendment, but I do want to get to a couple of quick questions on that. One, what limitations do you feel that need to be placed on the Second Amendment? Well, I don't believe any limitations need to be placed on the Second Amendment, but should we be open to a discussion about keeping guns out of the hands of the mentally ill? Yes, we should. Should we be open to a discussion on how you keep guns out of the hands of a potential terrorist? Yes, we should. But um, keep in mind that the uh, FBI interviewed the shooter in Orlando, Mateen, three times. Mm -hmm. Well, as President of the United States, I would love to know what, what transpired uh, in those interviews and why didn't they nail him somehow? And going forward, what would the FBI have regarding a suggestion on how, from a policy standpoint, we move forward. His case agent apparently has reported that he was told to back off on both that case and the one from the Orlando shooter, but we'll see if that ultimately turns out to be we'll true. See if that, uh, I wanted to point out also, Kevin, that um, a poll came out a couple of days ago among active military personnel and who they supported for President of the United States. Um, I just think it was terrific that 39% of active military right now support Johnson for president, 31% Trump, and 20% Clinton. Well, that's a good number for you, and I think it's an important voting block because their lives are on the line when, when the president operates. Right? And, and what are they saying? Are they saying, gosh, uh, we're willing to give our lives for this country, but we would certainly like judicious use of the force that we represent? Mm -hmm. I'd like to think so. So one last question uh, on the issue of drugs. You, you've been a strong advocate for the legalization of marijuana, and a lot of people argue that the drug syndicates and those are part are the major problem that comes from it. It's the, it's the fact that it's illegal that makes it dangerous for many other than those consuming it. Um, but you've drawn a line at marijuana. Why is that? Um, by the way, in 1999, highest elected official in the United States to call for the legalization of marijuana. I'm saying the same things today that I said in 1999, and that is I am only advocating the legalization of marijuana. I think when we do that, and I think we're on the verge of doing it, I think California is going to vote to do it in November recreationally, and I think that's going to be the tipping point. I think that 20 states will legislate legalized marijuana overnight as a result of California. But I think when we as a country legalize marijuana, we're going to come to a quantum leap of understanding drugs and drug abuse, and it's going to start uh, with recognizing drugs as a health issue rather than a criminal justice issue. But I think that you really confuse the issue by talking about the legalization of any drugs, in this case beyond marijuana. With that said, Governor, is there anything that you would like to take uh, 30 seconds to tell the audience while you have the opportunity? 
Well, just uh, uh, Google Gary Johnson. Give Gary Johnson, uh, Bill Weld, uh, a look at, and I think what you're going to find is genuine smaller government. I think what you're going to find is uh, backing choice for individuals, uh, freedom, liberty, when it comes to you and I living our lives. And then uh, lastly, how about, how about a skeptic at the table when it comes to these military interventions? But these military interventions have really resulted in a less safe, not a more safe world. Thank you so much, Governor. Kevin, I really thank you appreciate very much. you coming in thank and you. talking with us thank today. You. It's been it's been quite the honor to have you at my table. You've been watching Kevin McDonald and this is Facets Television and with us tonight was Gary Johnson, candidate for president for the United States in 2016 and thank you for watching.